Hello, I'm Eric Guido, and welcome to Venice in the Kitchen. Today I'm preparing one of my true favorites, going back to when I first started cooking professionally, brisato al barolo. Brisato al barolo, Italian for essentially a braised chuck steak using Nebbiolo wine, as well as beef stock to braise, and including a very simple yet extremely flavorful and aromatic set of vegetables. So this is yet again another low and slow moist heat preparation. It's the reason why a roast like the chuck roast is ideal for it, because there's a lot of connective tissue in here that if cooked at a very slow pace and low temperature, literally will turn this into fork tender, fall off your fork goodness. Now this recipe would usually call for about a five to six pound chuck roast. But that's if you're making it for an entire group of people, seven, eight people. I'm just cooking for a family of four. So when you watch what I do today, I just want you to keep in mind that you could easily double this recipe and have perfect results. I'm just gonna go with what I'm actually going to be feeding people today. So I have about a two and a half to three pound chuck roast here. What I also have, vegetable-wise, we have carrots, celery. Usually I would call for a whole onion, but I'm going to use a shallot, simply because the smaller piece of meat, the recipe again, in half of what I would usually prepare. Sage, we are gonna be using thyme, and then also I'm going to need two sprigs of rosemary. So we're going to start off the process with searing our chuck roast very quickly and preparing for it to go into the braise. And while we do that, we'll prepare our vegetables as well. So we want to get our pot up to a decent high temperature. Again, I'm using a ceramic pot. I like the, the fact that it gives me even heat throughout the process, but you can very easily use a large gauge stainless steel pot, or if you have a Dutch oven, a Dutch oven is absolutely Perfect. I'm going to pack my meat down here a little bit to make sure it's nice and dry. This has been out of the refrigerator for about an hour to bring it as close to room temperature as possible. I'm not going to put the oil in the pan. I'm instead going to pour a little bit of oil over the actual chuck roast and rub it in. Again, I don't want this oil smoking up. That's what it really comes down to. And then I'm going to season it liberally with salt and pepper. Don't worry about all this salt, guys. It's all going to translate into flavor, not saltiness. And then we're going to go right into the pan. Set my timer as a guide for two minutes. That's already smelling pretty amazing. Now while that's working, we're gonna do a little bit of quick prep on our vegetables. This is an easy process. Number one, when it comes to the herbs, I'm gonna leave the thyme and the rosemary intact. Cause I actually like to let these sit on top of the actual braise. As to the sage, I will separate these. All these have of course been washed already. Carrots, you could cut these up into more bite-sized pieces, but with this preparation, I have really loved to instead leave the carrots whole, especially since they're cooking so long, it actually makes for a really good looking uh, presentation on the plate as well. They have been well washed. I'm just gonna take off the tips. And then, I'm not going to take off all of the skin. Again, these have been well washed. All I'm going to do is take off the skin over about half of the actual carrot. Okay, let's clean this up a little bit. And I'm going to get ready now to turn over our chuck. Be very careful. Remember this pan is hot. I'm putting a little more oil on there. 
and then again, salt, guys this smells amazing. <laughs> You know, this is going to be cooking for about three and a half hours total, so do make sure you give yourself a good amount of time for preparation as well. And time to flip. Put that to the side. Okay, next, shallot is an easy preparation. We're going to keep this together to a large degree basically just going to quarter it. Our five cloves of garlic are good as they are. And then our celery, basically just going to cut this down into slightly smaller pieces. This is all good here. Just about ready to flip. Now this is a smaller chuck roast than usual. If you really had a six pound chuck roast, you'd probably have much more uh, meat on these two sides. And so you'd want to probably give that a lot of attention. But today, since I've got a smaller roast, I'm just gonna give it about a minute on that side. You can see this side's well rounded as well, so. Okay, so I'm gonna use my lid here to hold this and let it rest for a minute while I get my vegetables together. Right into the pan, ladies and gentlemen. We're basically looking to take advantage of the fact that we have all of those cooked on pieces from the chuck roast. Season this with salt and pepper. You know, another thing I like to do with this preparation, but I simply didn't have to use, I like to add a little bit of dried porcini mushrooms to this early in the mix and let it cook with the stock. It really adds a, a real nice umani flavor at the end. Okay, so here's the part that drives everybody crazy. The name of the dish is brizzato al barolo. Notice I'm turning the heat down a little bit. This dish may be named brizzato al barolo, but it is not common that the average person is actually going to braise this in an entire pot full of barolo. Barolo can be very expensive. So I'll usually go for a longing nebbiolo. I like to go with something fresh, something that doesn't see a lot of time in, in any new wood. So Purgatorio del Barbaresco, longing nebbiolo is perfect. Everyone who loves this wine, please forgive me for what I'm about to do. I am pouring a half bottle of Nebbiolo into this pot. Turn the heat back on high. Moving these around to make sure we got any of that cooked on fond off the bottom of our pot. You know, truth is, guys, I could have used that uh, that bigger chuck roast if I had one because this also makes for amazing leftovers. This is one of those dishes that when you cook it, the reality is it's actually better the next day. So there's certainly nothing wrong with preparing this one day, putting it away after it's all done, and then pulling it out the next day and simply heating it fixing the sauce up and serving it. People will be amazed. Now, I'm going to add in a little bit of my beef stock, but not all, because what I don't want to do is I don't want to put too much liquid in here. I want to be able to have the ability to add in as much as I like to bring it right up to the middle of my roast, or my chuck. Put that in. And we're almost done. I'm gonna add a little bit more stock to this. I like to drape them over the top of the braise. Because once we put this top on, 
this is going to become basically a sealed container that is going to be slowly simmering in our oven for about three to three and a half hours. And all of these herbs, the aromas, the flavors, they will be infused into the meat. Okay, so we are just about ready now to bring this to the oven. As you can see, we have a very light boil going on around the braise. And we're now going to put the top on. And this is going to be placed into our oven. You want to keep it near the middle. And it will braise for about three hours. In the middle of the process, I do want you to pull it out and to flip it one time, just so that both parts of the meat have the ability to cook evenly between the submerged part and the part that's just cooking from the steam created from the braise itself. Other than that, all we have to do is sit back and smell the amazing aromas coming out of this oven for the next three hours. Until later, when I show you how to complete this dish, thank you for joining me. Welcome back. So. About three hours and 15 minutes have passed, and our braise should be done. As I mentioned before, I flipped it in the middle of the process. So we're gonna take it out, be very careful. It is hot, and it smells amazing. Move it to a little hot rack. Ready for the reveal? So this is gonna have lost a lot of its water, so it's gonna have shrunk down a little bit. But that's exactly what I want to see. Notice the meat has actually taken on the color of the Barolo itself. Next, we are going to move the brisato out of this pot. I'm going to take the sprigs of herbs I put here and I am going to discard them. You want to be very careful taking this out because it is literally fall apart tender. And it's also very hot. Very carefully. I'm going to move this over to my cutting board. One of the carrots came with it, that's okay. As you see, fall apart, tender. And I'm immediately gonna cover this with foil. This needs to rest no less than a half an hour. While it's resting, I'm going to remove my vegetables from here. Look at those carrots. Wow. This is the reason why we kept part of the skin on. You see how this literally just falls apart. But that's okay. These are going to look amazing on our platter. I'll take out the other veggies as well. And the reason I'm taking these out is that I want to serve these on the platter. I want to dry them out a little bit. I'm going to put them back in the oven and just kind of let them roast. A little dry heat to intensify their flavors. Because right now they taste a lot like soup vegetables. But a little time in the oven is going to completely change that around. Let's put this in the oven, let them just roast a little bit. Chinois, extremely handy, very fine mesh. However, you could very easily use any kind of sieve to do this exact same process. This is unnecessary because we're going to be removing things that are significantly smaller than that's going to catch. We can ladle this right in. So what this is going to do is it's going to separate the fat that cooked off from the braise. But it's going to keep all the flavor and all the goodness in there. But it's going to take any little bits out so that we can make a really nice fine sauce. Because we're now going to cook this down and turn this into liquid gold. Also, 
all the collagen that came from all that connective tissue from the braise cooking in this liquid for so long has given it a really velvety mouthfeel. I mean, this stuff is going to taste incredibly rich. And it's going to be rich, but it's not rich through fat. It's just literally taking on all the qualities of the connective tissue from the meat that it's cooked down. All right. While that cools, the fat is going to separate through the top. And then we're going to start cooking this down on our stovetop. So we're here. Okay, that needs a little time to separate. So while that's happening, now let's talk really quick about wine pairings. Now, of course, there is the absolute simplest way that you can go, and it makes all the sense in the world, and it would be fantastic. It's brisato al Barolo. Pairing it with Barolo is a no-brainer. Now, I like to have a mature bottle of Barolo. 1999 is a great vintage, and a year that's now finally starting to come into its own. You don't have to go 20 years old on a bottle of Barolo. You go for a riper vintage, like 2011. Uh, 2007 is drinking great right now. Even something like 2012. These wines, they all have different vintage characteristics that allow certain vintages to be drank earlier than others, but I really feel this is a very special dish, and so I'd like to pull a special wine. Next pairing that makes all the sense in the world. You used half a bottle of wine to cook this dish, why not use the other half bottle of wine to have with it? So I opened this much earlier today, and what I'll usually do in this situation, almost any time a wine gets opened in this house, is I'll just pour the remainder into a half bottle, put the cork in, and then put it in the refrigerator until about an hour before we're ready to serve. This is going to be just as fresh as if I just poured it this afternoon. Purgatorio del Barbaresco is also one of the, in my opinion, best Longue Nebbiolos coming out of the region. Imagine pairing the exact same wine that we cook the meat in with the meat at the table. But there's another pairing that I really love from Italy as well. I love Tarossi with Brosato al Barolo. So they call Tarossi the Barolo of the South, and there's a really good reason for it. What I like about Tarossi is that it brings a almost like an animal, earthy nature to the entire equation. They also have really great acidity. This producer, Gustafaro, is one of the top producers in the region. If you can see the vines that he uses to produce the Primum Reserva, we're talking about vines that are 150 to 175 years old. This is serious juice and really great with this dish. But there's another route we can go, another favorite I have at Brizado al Barolo, that takes us out of Italy, but is something you should definitely try. Ribera del Duero, the grape, Tempranillo. What I love about the Roberta del Duero and Tempranillo is the acidity that this brings and an almost kind of citrusy spiciness to these wines. Now this producer in particular, Dominio de la Guila, is actually making wines from some of the highest elevation vineyards in the entire region, from vines that are over a hundred years old. This winery has basically reinvented this part of Roberta del Duero and brought it back to the public eye. What they're doing is really exciting stuff. Ribeiro de Duero is a really great way to go with Prezato al Barolo. Any of these would be a fantastic pairing. Okay, so now I am bringing the heat up on the pan that I'm going to be reducing our sauce in. As that heats up, the man behind the curtain just needs to put a vegetable in for the family. A little broccoli raw, bitter greens, Big favor of this family, just simply uh, blanching them. They're not going to cook completely in this uh, boiling water. This is just really salty boiling water that I'm putting these in. That's just going to start the cooking process. Consider this a little bonus round. And now, start pouring my sauce into the pan. You want this pan to be hot because we want to really reduce this sauce. So we took out the fat 
that came off of the braise. But if we look over here, we have a couple tablespoons of butter. And the reason why that's there is that when we're ready to go with this sauce, we're going to taste it, and we're going to judge from its level of acidity and its level of seasoning if we're going to want to balance it out a little bit, or even maybe, maybe make it give it a little more richness. It doesn't need the butter, necessarily, but if you taste it and you feel like the flavor is too sharp, uh, maybe a little too salty, that's when you would add the butter in. All the butter is going to do is balance it and give you a little bit more of a velvety, richer texture to the sauce. Okay, so our vegetables are working in the oven. Our sauce is reducing. I'm making a little bitter greens in the side. I'm going to give you guys a little break. Why don't you have a glass of wine? And then when I come back, we're going to finish this all up and plate it. See you in a few minutes. Okay, we're ready to finish this up now. So if you come on over here and take a look at our sauce, that's number one. As you can see, this has heavily reduced. So I'm going to give it a little taste. What am I looking for? Is it over-seasoned? Is it under-seasoned? Is it too high in acidity? It doesn't need any seasoning whatsoever. But I will give it one of these teaspoons of butter. Sorry, tablespoons of butter. Bring the heat down really low now. Now just for some fun garnishes here before we finish things up. Or should I say extra veggies inside? I am going to sear some mitake mushrooms. This is not a classic pairing, mind you. It's just something that we absolutely love here. Salt and pepper. A little ghee in my pan here. Now with these, when you clean them up, you really just need to uh, cut them off a little bit on the bottom here and then trim them into like a flat because when they come together, they're usually bunched together. Trim them to like flat and they go right into the butter. Again, this is not a classic pairing, but as I mentioned earlier today, we usually have porcini mushrooms, which I didn't have. And so this is my way of getting my mushroom fix in. Those are gonna work. Back there, up front here, going to take a little bit of olive oil into this pan. Start to saute some garlic, just for our bitter greens. Notice it's a really rough chop on the garlic. You know, garlic cooks significantly better when it's in larger pieces. Garlic doesn't like to cook fast. It actually likes to cook very slow. But one way you can counteract that is to put it into larger pieces so that even though you may get a toastiness on the outside, that on the inside it'll be perfection. And don't worry about your sauce. It's just doing its thing over here. The butter is fully melted. It's nice and warm and it's over in low flame. While you do that, I'm going to peek in here really quick. These are looking perfect. They'll be coming out in a minute. I'll move this out of the way and this. So with me, when I make dishes that have garlic, like this broccoli rabe. I actually don't like to have the garlic mixed in with the broccoli rabe. I like to cook it off in the oil, let the oil be infused by the flavor of the garlic, and then bring the garlic back, because everybody has their different desire of the amount of garlic they want to have in a dish. Check on these mushrooms for a quick second. Almost there. Can't tell how easy it is to do this with hitake mushrooms and how good they are. They're absolutely amazing. And then in our oil, 
going to go in there with the broccoli rub. This is a really quick process, guys. Okay. 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 Get that little salt. Now, as you guys probably know by now, I am a big fan of always thinking ahead. I have a little garlic infused olive oil here. I'm just adding it to the pan. And I'm taking it off the heat. I'm leaving it on the burner, but the burner's off. Okay, because it's already par cooked in the boiling water. And just so you guys know, it only sat in that boiling water for maybe a minute. Notice the color on this. The reason it has that color is because it only sat in that water for a minute. And now my mataki mushrooms should definitely be ready to flip. Oh my. Yes. This is exactly what we want to see. Look at that, huh? Those are beautiful. Sauce? Look at this velvety sauce, guys. Look at this. The sheen to that. Keep in mind, there's only one tablespoon of butter in here. Other than that, we've taken all the fat out. This is what you get. Low and slow braising. This is a result of the meat we cook in it. And now, we're going to turn our attention back over here. Notice that I have this pan on the stove, and the reason is that the heat coming out of the stove is pretty hot. And now this pan is pretty hot, but that's what we want. I'm going to take out my vegetables. Tell me, that doesn't look amazing. This is why we roasted these carrots. also have a little secret tray of roasted potatoes in here for the kids. We're also going to use these. We're going to leave them in here for now. Okay, the brisato. Don't worry, it's still going to be hot. It's fully rested now, but it is very tender. And so, I always like to use an electric knife for this part. I'm going to turn my attention to the mushrooms for one minute and just bring the burner down here just to make sure they don't burn while I'm working. And here we go. Electric knife, not a necessity, but extremely helpful in these preparations. This meat just wants to fall apart, guys. Best way to move it, long spatula. It's actually a fish spatula. Oh, that looks beautiful. Look at that. Here we go, take a look at this. Look at that. Look at that. You know, growing up, I had both an Italian influence as well as a Polish influence in my family. And so while the Italian influence would make something like risotto al barolo, the Polish influence would make something called boiled beef. And I gotta tell you, both of them are pretty amazing preparations. Okay. I'm gonna put my mushrooms on here. These guys are gonna be so good. Vegetables back in. Some of this garlic. Now, obviously, guys, you see I'm using my hands, but these hands get cleaned over and over and over again. I like to keep the vegetables separate so that people can see them on the plate and they can go for what they like. up here a little bit. And now, some of these roasted potatoes. So 
potatoes are simple, okay? I just tossed some salt, pepper, a little bit of garlic granules, and then I uh, coated them with some olive oil, and then tossed them in the oven at 425 in a half hour. Voila. We'll put some of these right over here. And now, let's move this out of the way. Go to our sauce. Sauce is nice and hot. bit on the plate here. Moisten it up. I said the meat is hot, but this will give it a little extra boost. The rest of this is going to go in my gravy boat. Now plating the broccoli rabe like that before is really simple. I'm literally just going to take the broccoli rabe and plate it for everybody individually and give the people who like garlic garlic and the people who don't, don't. And then just, uh, literally, this is for garnish, guys. This is all this is. Some fresh sprigs of thyme. And rosemary. Voila! There we have it, guys. Brizzato al Barolo. Ready to go? I cannot wait to dig into this. I hope you guys try this recipe and let me know what you think. It's one of my absolute favorites. Until next time, I'm Eric Guido, Venice in the Kitchen. See you soon.